General Bolivar was a revolutionary. During the long struggle for independence, he constantly advised the separate countries of Latin America to unite. Only in unity, he argued, could they confront their external enemies, old and new. But he never lived to realize his revolutionary dream. In 1830, he resigned as president of Colombia, and after a long journey down the Magdalena River to the sea, he died near Santa Marta. Ill and depressed, with the countries of Latin America divided from each other, he felt that his life's work had been in vain. Garcia Marquez claims that he was never much interested in Bolivar. His original fascination had been with the Magdalena, the river that winds through Colombia from the Andes to the Caribbean. I began to know it as a child, traveling from the Caribbean coast where I had the good fortune to be born, to the distant, fog-bound city of Bogota. As a student, I sailed the river 11 times in both directions, traveling on steamboats that came out of the shipyards of the Mississippi, already condemned to nostalgia, and possessed of a mythic call that no writer could resist. For Garcia Marquez, that mythic call has come many times. Several of his novels have to do with provincial Colombia and the magic of that great river. But intrigued by the story of Bolivar's last journey, Garcia Marquez gradually became obsessed, not with the river, but with the man. He spent two years researching the historical detail of Bolivar's life. So this is not magic realism, never a very satisfactory description of Garcia Marquez's work but something rather closer to history and to politics. In effect, Garcia Marquez, who is a left-wing political activist as well as a novelist, is trying to reappropriate Bolivar for the left. Bolivar is not exactly a figure of the right, but in most of Latin America, he's suffered from serious overexposure. As a result, he's been politically emasculated. Over the past 150 years, his historical image has become encrusted with myth rather like that of Lenin in the Soviet Union. But he's no longer a real person, and his political message, his drive for continental unity, and his progressive vision of a Latin America liberated and free has lost its meaning. Far from uniting the continent under one banner, as Bolivar had recommended, the wars of independence led to the establishment of small, balkanized countries with weak governments, oppressed peoples and ill-defined borders. There is, therefore, a tragic dimension to Bolivar's life. At the end, his work lay in ruins. No one wanted to listen to his lectures on unity. He'd failed, and he knew it. Out of this tragedy of collapsed dreams, Garcia Marquez creates a flesh-and-blood protagonist, not a neutered and romanticized painting. Investigating Bolivar's life, he found that the one-dimensional hero of the official myth began to disappear. Ignoring the years of military glory, he concentrates instead on the time of failure. He depicts a real person with physical ailments, moods of depression, and philosophical contradictions. By doing so, he strips away the layers of myth that surround the politics of the independent struggle and allows the real liberator to emerge. Garcia Marquez reminds us, for example, that although Bolivar was a wealthy landowner, he was also a black. He could not really be characterized as an African or even as a mulatto, but he would certainly have passed as a colored under South Africa's racial legislation. The oldest of his portraits was an anonymous miniature painted in Madrid when he was 16. 
When he was 32, another was painted in Haiti, and both were faithful to his age and Caribbean character. He had a strain of African blood through a paternal great-great-grandfather who had fathered a son by a slave woman, and it was so evident in his features that the aristocrats in Lima called him Sambo. But as his glory increased, the painters began to idealize him, washing his blood, mythologizing him, until they established him in official memory with the Roman profile of his statues. Bolivar's black features were obliterated from the historical record, removing a truth about him that the racist successor regimes to the Spanish Empire, anti-Indian and anti-black, were keen to forget. By encouraging his readers to remember Bolivar's blackness, Garcia Marquez is trying to remind them that the Latin America of the future has to be constructed by the people who made up its past, the Spanish and the Portuguese, and the Indians and the blacks. Garcia Marquez gives an unfamiliar and somewhat unflattering picture of Bolivar. He's decrepit, deteriorated, prematurely aged. His philosophy is not a seamless web of wisdom, but a mass of contradictions created on the hoof. Not surprisingly, Garcia Marquez has been attacked for this by people who think he's criticizing Latin America's untouchable heritage. But the Bolivar he recreates was, as a young man, a genuine revolutionary, both in thought and deed. The novelist Bolivar lived at a time of revolution in the outside world. In his remembered youth, he had had first-hand experience of post-revolutionary France. He kept Rousseau for his bedside reading. Ideas of freedom and independence were bursting out all over the Caribbean. Bolivar was to bring the revolution to Latin America and then he discovered how to do it. Bolivar fell under the spell of Napoleon. He was present at that dazzling spectacle in the great cathedral in Milan when Napoleon Bonaparte was crowned as emperor. Napoleon's military achievements and Rousseau's social contract were to be the two major influences on Bolivar's life. What Napoleon had done for Europe, Bolivar felt he could do for Latin America. Yet Garcia Marquez is at pains to show that Bolivar was neither a simple Bonapartist nor an uncritical supporter of Rousseau. His Bolivar eventually gets rather tired of Rousseau and emphasizes that, unlike Napoleon, he would never have allowed himself to be crowned as an absolute monarch. He admired Napoleon but was opposed to dictatorship. Yet, even with these qualifications, the Bolivar of Garcia Marquez is full of contradictions. There are times when he wants the liberation and unity of Latin America so much that he is prepared to accept the mantle of a dictator. He did so, in fact, both in Peru and in Colombia. In a similar way, Garcia Marquez explains that although Bolivar admired the philosophy of Rousseau and the pragmatism of the English, he was not prepared to import these foreign ideas wholesale into Latin America. Europeans believe that only what Europe invents is good for the entire universe, and anything else is detestable. Bolivar goes on to defend some of the sterner parts of his record as a military leader, and to place it in a global context. During the war to the death, I myself gave the order to execute 800 Spanish prisoners in a single day, including the patients in the hospital at La Guaira, Today, under the same circumstances, my voice would not tremble if I gave the order again. And Europeans would not have the moral authority to reproach me. For if any history is drowned in blood, in dignity and in justice, it is the history of Europe. On St. Bartholomew's night, the number of slain reached more than 2,000 in 10 hours. During the splendor of the Renaissance, 12,000 mercenaries in the pay of the imperial armies sacked and devastated Rome 
and cut the throats of 8,000 of its inhabitants. Bolivar's anger finally spills out against the Europeans themselves. He pillories them for being sanctimonious. Stop doing us the favor of telling us what we should do, he concluded. Don't attempt to teach us how we should be. Don't attempt to make us just like you. Don't try to have us do well in 20 years what you have done so badly in 2000. Damn it, please let us have our Middle Ages in peace. In the final pages of the novel, as Bolivar travels downriver to exile and to death, it seems as though everything he had fought for had turned to dust. He wrote at the end, in a famous phrase, that he had ploughed the sea. But Garcia Marquez does not allow him to make such a pessimistic exit. Bolivar recalls the previous journeys that he had made down the Magdalena River. It was the fourth time he had traveled the Magdalena and he could not escape the impression that he was retracing the steps of his life. On the third voyage, aboard a paddle boat, as he called it, the work of liberation had been concluded, but his almost maniacal dream of continental unity was beginning to crumble. On this, his final voyage, the dream was already destroyed but it survived in a single sentence he never tired of repeating. Our enemies will have all the advantages until we unify the government of America. The message comes again in a different form when General Bolivar and Lorenzo Carcamo, an old comrade in arms, are discussing what went wrong with the liberation struggle against Spain. We lost a world, Simon, my old friend, said Lorenzo Carcamo. They lost it for us, said the general. And the only thing to do now is to start again from the beginning. <laughs> 